I miei ringraziamenti okay, non sono all, uh, come quelli di um, tutti. I would like uh, to thank, my thanks are not at all formal thanks. I am a sociologist, I do not deal with camps, I do not deal with the memory of these camps or the experiences made here, I do not deal with migration processes, so actually my thanks lies in the fact that uh, I have been given the chance to deal with a topic uh, that is very dear to me and that has all sort of been one of my obsessions and if I manage to give at least one tenth of the uh, one tenth of the stimuli that I got from previous presentations I can be happy of that so um, I had some handouts of my paper so if you are interested and curious about certain aspects of my speech uh, my paper is going to be available for you I'm going to talk about a topic uh, starting from a, a consideration uh, by other scholars on the suprafunctional nature, not so much of camps, uh, but also of a whole series of uh, devices that are systematically organized in camps and that we find in a contemporary reality. Uh, in a diversified way and in contexts which are sometimes also far away from what is apparently a camp. Uh, an example of that is the walls. What I'm going to say here about this, so the su suprafunctional uh, nature of the camp, of contemporary camps, uh, uh, the supra-functional nature of camps, uh, of transit camps, of filtering and governing uh, migration processes is demanded by fact, exactly as is the self-evident function of walls to block, to represent a border. And as a matter of fact, the border between the United States and Mexico has led to an exponential increase of migration flows and has not contributed to reduce them. Then, Prospect, the prospect, that's a sociological prospect and I tried actually to use this prospect to uh, thematize this kind of um, uh, issues. So the form of association that goes back to the Urzim, that's the idea that we can understand a lot of societies and of the formations that we make reference to by looking at some forms being created, at some perimeters which can be um, uh, basically observed and looking at the relations in those areas. This can help us understand not so much and not only what takes place inside that perimeter, but rather what that perimeter and the way it works, uh, the, uh, what works inside that perimeter uh, says generally. Then the demand, that is probably the key point of my reasoning. In other words, this is basically what motivated my talk. When it comes to camps and the history of camps and on the attempt of, con of giving continuity in view of all the discontinuities that camps have had in history from the colonial period till now, I mean, much has been written about that, so I could have... Uh, uh, not said anything on that, but I was very much curious on this, meaning what are the effects and the consequences that re the recourse to camps as a form imply for those communities using the camps that legitimate that form. So not so much what happens in there, which is fundamental, it uh, requires us to carry out this kind of investigation in the past and in the present, but rather it's important to point out what the camp means for us, what it means for us to be part of a social community, of a social formation that adopts and thinks it is legitimate to use that specific form. Uh, as Simmel would say, what it means for our societies. In other words, what kind of effects it has, what kind of uh, um, limitations does it have on us. So this is the object, in other words, that's basically the way that I use to pose uh, this question.
Uh, and this is what I'm, by object I mean the so-called infrastructures of experience. So I've had two starting points for my reasoning. This might uh, actually have two starting points. The first one is a famous one by Zygmunt Bauman. Um, and basically a text by Bauman that I re-read last summer and all the things that Bauman says basically start from this question which is the one I tried to adopt, however, by uh, focusing on another object of observation. Bauman says that actually he was uh, um, reasoning on the studies and the analysis uh, that uh, were dominating at the time of his writing uh, on the issues uh, related to the Holocaust. And he said the real problem does not consist uh, in asking what we as sociologists can uh, ask ourselves and have to say on the Holocaust, but rather what the Holocaust has to tell us as sociologists and our activity. And the whole book. Uh, all the reflection by Bauman is a reflection that he used to show that contrary to many analyses he did, some explicitly, other implicitly, so the fact that the Holocaust was some kind of a pathology of a social system, of a kind of modernity that was physiologically functioning and that had made it block and stop for a while. So Bauman's work in that text is aimed at showing how that event, that fact and that experience was per se an ev a physiological experience, any physiological event that has to deal with the intrinsic uh, mechanisms of that same pathway towards modernity. So I might stop here. And actually, what I uh, would like to invite everybody to do is exactly this, to pose yourself the question, this question, but to frame this question in a different time frame. In other words, we should all ask ourselves this question, but vis-a-vis -a, -vis a different context, in the context of a camp that started from colonial times and that we experience today, so a legacy with no messages, with no accompanying documents. So something that has to be constantly reinterpreted. So this question is fully legitimate. This was the first starting point. The second starting point, which apparently has nothing to do with that, but I think it is indispensable, and that's probably the reason why I tried to do this reasoning, um, has to deal with uh, the other side of the issue. In other words, what I am talking about is not so much the experience of the concentration camp, but rather the contemporary situation, a contemporary situation in which Bauman he gives himself uh, um, the experience of a camp, of a certain type of, uh, of camp, of uh, certain elements, uh, recurring elements in a, in, a, in a camp like, for example, the walls, the gatekeepers, uh, or opposite camps in which, for example, you have the, the good who are inside and the bad, the evils are outside. Everything that's bad is outside. But actually, it works the other side down, the other way around. So you have this second uh, um, starting point. I think this was particularly important for my reasoning for a certain reason. This is just, I mean, to serve as the basis of a research project that is yet to be.
And that is because, as Fischer said, we have to bear in mind that capitalism is an impersonal and hyper-abstract structure. It's a moloch which is completely out of control and we do not have the chance to modify it, including the aspects that we are very much interested here. And the fact that this structure would not exist uh, without our cooperation. So you can also do the other exercise, the opposite exercise. I mean, you reapply this to the Holocaust case. In that case, too, that experience would have not been possible without their cooperation. And this issue. Uh, appears today in a different shape, in a different form. Maybe it's something that is very far away from us, with which we do not have to deal directly. We are no social workers uh, who happen to work in this kind of structures, but still, somehow, they would not exist without our cooperation. Allow me to translate uh, this into uh, uh, easier terms. Uh, my attempt here is to reflect on a different story. When I wrote this, uh, and I wrote this down, not you know, the uh, history presents everything as if uh, everything could have not taken place uh, in a different way, and yet uh, it could have uh, taken place in a uh, hundred ways. And this was written by Elias Canetti. So the problem I have as a sociologist, uh, and this is uh, some kind of a personal ob obsession of mine, is how I can, uh, I mean, um, explain reality without uh, the, without this explanation to in a way annihilate what is possible without for this reality to in a way uh, hide what is possible but actually what is possible should be promoted if possible it should be supported if it is possible so um this operation, in my opinion, can be done in a very interesting way, in a very effective way, interesting meaning that it tells something about ourselves in uh, actually facing that specific object. I do not have any specific competence on the camps as they are configured in contemporary world, but actually I do wonder what camps have to to do with me. So very effectively, I think that Professor Gordon at the beginning of these works uh, gave an overview of uh, the various metaphors with which the camp was uh, conceived, so as a production line, as factory, as an entry point, and so on. Thinking about the version we are interested in in our contemporary reality, Besides these functions, we should use uh, the camp as a dump, uh, as a dump site. Our soci uh, societies are societies in which, uh, in order to get rid of uh, rubbish, actually they use space uh, to get rid of a, uh, of a space uh, in order... So using uh, a space in order to get rid of rubbish. And what are the societies that use dump sites? It is normally those societies that uh, did not learn, have not yet learned to close the vital cycle of uh, goods, of the uh, commodities. So we have not yet learned uh, how to close the life cycle of people. And so we are using space uh, as a place, as a device, helping us to, to treat what we cannot elsewhere uh, um, um, and in a different way treat. So in order to explain uh, what uh, might be uh, my personal delirium, I would like to point out that this issue of infrastructures uh, was uh, due to the fact that I had just uh, read a book by uh, a U.S. writer, Extra Statecraft, in which the writer illustrates that in the organization of contemporary urban places, she uses a paradigm, the paradigm of zones. So basically she talks about uh, uh, the form that special economic areas or zones use inside the states. 
So they have a certain territorial position, but they link that territory to faraway lands for commercial tax reasons, sometimes also for scientific reasons. And the writer shows that this is possible due to infrastructures that are material aspects, so connection infrastructures, for example, internet cables, uh, uh, under the seas, etc. But infrastructures also as codes. In other words, we're talking about quality standards or reputational norms that private agencies like uh, the ones uh, we know which regulate everything Basically, these uh, entities make our context conform. So infrastructures are the material context that basically uh, regulates our lives. And the text that was so well illustrated by Gordonelli this morning by Didier Berman, Ojanari, in this text, the authors talk about this topic, the topic which is in the title of my uh, presentation, so counter-fatality, counter-fate, so to say. So, Didier Berman says that the documentary talks about the fatal nature of what's real. So, what's fatal is actually what inevitably happens in the world. But at the same time, it also talks about the counterfeite, of what's counterfatal. So basically, counterfeit uh, exists because the same witness uh, still is uh, close to us, so without uh, mm, ceasing to be uh, away from us, uh, is uh, so determined that he can come back to us as a ghost, as a haunting presence. He can uh, chase us, he can uh, help us act uh, in a different way. He can help us act otherwise. And this is what I said before, in the real, you still have the possible. In the last four minutes I have left, so five minutes, so in these five minutes I would like briefly to say that if all of this is valid, well then, why is it mini meaningful to use this infrastructure, this concept of the infrastructure of the experience? When talking about infrastructure, this term is very useful because it recalls a very important question that I mentioned at the beginning, which is very dear to me. In other words, it recalls the epistemology in my paper, I talk, uh, I make reference uh, to the epistemology of the complexity. So Gregory Bateson, who says that uh, there is a strong relationship between uh, what we observe, what is observed, and the observer. So you cannot close uh, the loop of, of the observation because actually you cannot make it objective because the ob observed object and the nature of the object depend on the observer. And this has a great uh, empowering uh, effect uh, in the way in which we talk about uh, an object. The way we talk about an object has implications on the way we define it. There's another text that I would recommend to you all, and it is yet another text by Didier Berman that was translated into Italian. That's the survival of the fireflies, if I'm not mistaken. That's a text of 2010. So the author mm, discusses with Agamben and uh, with Pasolini. And he sort of goes against their views because he says, he states that uh, their views are so powerful and they show mechanisms of dominance which are so powerful that what they, what he terms the counterfeit, the counterfatality, so the possibility for something to be different than what it is, gets lost. It is as if the representation of reality 
uh, gives us an inevitable fate uh, against which we cannot do anything. So infrastructure, infrastructure is because actually we are helped uh, to reflect on material, on the tangible and intangible nature of our existence. So uh, not so much experience that has to deal with the uh, nourishment of our mind, uh, uh, like, for example, photography or television or uh, the movies, but infrastructures also because the material character, the tangible character of things has powerful effects on the experience we make of them. Uh, so, by way of... Prego. Brian Eno, musica da ascensore, mi sembra una colonna sonora perfetta da questo punto di vista. <laughs> I'm almost uh, finished with my talk. So when talking to a social worker who works in one of these um, uh, facilities, he would tell me that it is the migrants themselves who, in order to refer to the various uh, uh, facilities where they transit, uh, they use the term camp. So where is the camp you come from, where, what's the camp where you've been, and these kind of things. So the imprinting of facilities, the material and tangible imprinting of uh, infrastructures is relevant. So infrastructures, the infrastructures of the experience, this expression actually uh, induces us to question the fact that these infrastructures are there as a second nature, sometimes they're not visible, but they are the result of the work of people. So people who do something and in a given way. So the process uh, that uh, migrants experience uh, when transiting uh, through these uh, facilities derive from the way in which they are called upon to do their work. Mm, the, their functions uh, are sometimes performed wrongly. And then finally, the infrastructure of the experience uh, invites us to think about the dimension of temporality. The dimension of time, uh, in the meaning by Hartog, so the uh, regimes of time, of temporality, because the, that refers to the way in which we connect the past, the present and the future, the way in which the field of experience uh, interacts uh, or conflicts uh, with or either compresses the uh, horizon of our expectations. And I'm finished. Thank you very much.